Hi, this is Scott Lancer, Director of Associates for Biblical Research, and I'm here today in the studio with Dr. Scott Stripling and Henry Smith, and we're discussing the early date of the Exodus. Today we're looking at some of the biblical data, and this is part two of that conversation, and we're so glad that you've joined us today. Well, I'm excited to be here again today with uh, Henry Smith, and Henry's our, the Administrative Director of our dig at Shiloh and a staff researcher. And Scott Stripling, Dr. Stripling, is the uh, dig director for AVR at Biblical Shiloh. Guys, we have been having a, a great discussion together about the, uh, the whole issue of the early date of the Exodus. Now, uh, for, for our viewers, the, the, the Exodus, everybody knows about it. Everybody knows it was a, uh, a critical uh, event in the, in the scriptures, a critical event in uh, the history of salvation. Mm. God's revealed truth about what he did. Uh, and we're talking about the proper dating of that event. And so we were looking at these scriptures and talking about them. And so we're going we're gonna to carry on and, and look at a, a couple of other really, really critical dates. Uh, that we, we want to discuss today. So uh, um, anyway, I, we're just so, so uh, we're, we're led of God's spirit to, to look into his word, to see what he has revealed mm -hmm. and including the chronological data. And so that's what our discussion is today. So um, Scott, we, we want to start with Ezekiel uh, chapter 40, verse one, and let's uh, use that as our launching point today. Okay, well, let me just real quickly review what we covered in the last segment, yes. which yeah. is uh, 1 Kings 6 1, Judges 11 26, and 1 Chronicles 6 33 through 37. So we, we saw how we get to 1446 from 1 Kings 6 1, mm -hmm. 480 years before the building of Solomon's temple, or in the 480th year, essentially gets us to that point. Um, in Judges 11.26, Jephthah synchronizes with that by saying in the year 1100, we've been here for 300 years already, and that puts us then where we want to be after the wilderness sojourn. And then we looked at the genealogy in, in uh, 1 Chronicles 6, where we went from Heman in the time of David all the way back to the time of Moses, and we counted the 18 generations there, added one for Solomon to get from David to Solomon, mm -hmm. did 19 times 25, added that to 966, and that put us once again in the mid-15th century. So we're pretty excited here. We've got some momentum as we move into this next segment, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, talking about here in e uh, Ezekiel 41. Yes. So um, yes. Ezekiel uh, makes some interesting statements here, and on the surface it seems to be kind of pedestrian. Henry, you have the text there? Go ahead and read it for us. Yeah, so uh, Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 1 says the following, in the 25th year of our exile at the beginning of the year, on the 10th of the month, in the 14th year after the fall of a city, referring to Jerusalem, <clears throat> on that very day the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there. Then he goes on to talk about his vision. He seems to be very precise, right? He's keeping yeah. track of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much so. Yeah, he seems to be very concerned with when these events are happening. Now, this becomes very interesting for us because when we reckon that there is a jubilee cycle that synchronizes with this, it really lights up. Now, of course, to refresh our minds, a jubilee is, is every 50 years. So we've got seven times seven, seven sabbatical years times seven is 49. And then the 50th year is the, the jubilee year when debts mm -hmm. are canceled and slaves yes. are yeah. set free and so forth. So they, these are kept up with very systematically, scribally. Mm -hmm. And what I believe we have here is the beginning of a jubilee cycle. Now, we get this from the Seder Olam. Now, the, the Seder mm -hmm. Olam is written in the second century, and we're not claiming that this is on the par with, with Scripture, but we use many extra biblical sources to help illuminate yes. the, uh, the text. So we have this uh, interesting passage telling us that there's a jubilee cycle, and the 16th cycle is actually beginning around 622 B.C., so then we have some clear dates. Let's see where it takes us. Yes. Well, if you take these cycles, say 16 cycles of 49 years, that equals 784 years. So sort of start with that number, 784. Then the beginning of the Jubilee cycle, as I said, was 622. Mm -hmm. So 784 plus 622 puts us in what year? 
1406. 1406. Well, is isn't that right? this yeah. something? Because yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. we go from 1446 minus a 40 year wilderness sojourn, and there we are once again, yeah. exactly yeah. where we would want to be. Fascinating. How does this keep happening? Uh, some would say, well, it's a confused biblical writer. Well, I guess they're all confused then because <laughs> <clears throat> now we're looking at four that have pointed us in the same direction. Yes. Yes, it's fascinating. These Jubilee <clears throat> cycles are instituted. I, if I'm correct, at, at, on the entrance into the land. Yes. Right? And then they're followed, they're tracked very closely. So there's twofold things happening. One is God is interested in time. We've said this in the mm -hmm. last episode, we'll continue to say that. You know, mm -hmm. the quintessential statement in the fullness of time, mm -hmm. God sent his son, right? Uh, for Israel, the time also has a practical application. The Jubilee right. cycle, there's certain things that take place. And then the 50th year is supposed to be this freeing of slaves mm -hmm. and returning of land. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it, it's supposed to be a, it's really a manifestation of God's kindness, His mm -hmm. grace in the community. Uh, and of course it points to Christ in a way too sure. as a type. Mm -hmm. So it's really fascinating. Not only the chronology is very precise, but it also helps the people of Israel to live according to how God wants them to. Yes. Well, and we start with the very specific chronological recollections there in, yeah. in Ezekiel 40, verse 1. Yeah. Then the Seder Olam picks that up. Now, by itself, since we're moving into the extra biblical literature, we would be very cautious about basing a date of the Exodus solely on that. Right. right. But when it's synchronizing then with the four biblical passages that we've already looked at, then we've got to consider yeah. that as an as a important source. Yeah, it's a, piece of, it's a piece of evidence. It's, a, it's an ancient text. The Seder Olam goes back to the second century. It's rabbinic. You mentioned Rabbi Absolutely. Akiva, right? So now the, these men were not followers of Jesus. They did reject Jesus as the Messiah, but they still handled the Old Testament text and they were very familiar with it. So we, we're not taking it by itself. We're taking it in a matrix of information. Like Absolutely. archaeology, we're doing the same thing with that. So this is the beauty of what we're trying to do as a ministry is use all the tools that are available to us because there's mm -hmm. nothing for us mm -hmm. to be afraid of. That's right. That's, That's right. right. So we're, we're interested in exploring this great issue of what is truth. They say in archaeology you shouldn't deal with, with issues of truth, you should deal with issues of fact. But I think we can, we're big boys, we can deal with both of them <laughs> yeah. sim simultaneously That's right. That's right. Um, and compartmentalize when we need to compartmentalize. We've looked at the Seder Olam and are interested in, in Shiloh because when we're, we're trying to nail down that chronology for that important period of time, the Seder Olam points to Shiloh and says that it, the Ark was there for 369 years. Mm -hmm. Well, that's probably a little bit long, okay? Um, it's mm -hmm. probably closer to three centuries, a little over three centuries that it's there. So we're not claiming that you know we stand by everything in the Seder Olam any sure. more than we have something like, say, the, the Book of Enoch that's quoted several times in the New Testament. We're not saying that everything of the Book of Enoch is, is, is gospel, right. yeah. but there's parts that are. And, and because of the synchronisms, I think this fits pretty nicely. Yes, you know. Truth springs out from the earth. You know, it, finds its, right. it finds its way out. And men can uh, mm -hmm. certainly get things correct. That's right. Uh, in terms That's of right. history, and we can use these tools to help us sort of put this all together. I, f I find it, yeah. I find it really fascinating. All the way down to the time of Ezekiel. So Ezekiel is what uh, seventh, late seventh century, sixth uh, century. Later than that, because later, he's in the right. exile. So right, oh, right, right, right. You know, he's mm -hmm. he's by the Kibar River yeah. in in, yeah. in Babylon. So you know, you're in mid sixth century or so. Yeah. 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 So again, another another prophet, another individual with a with an information chronology and. It, all these different authors, Jephthah, Moses, mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to talk about New Testament here soon. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, again, the data is there yeah. and the information is there all through peppered, if you want to say, throughout the scriptures. Right. Well, yeah. we seem to have a lot of confused biblical writers. If, yeah. if the yeah. date is not the, yeah. it's, it's not right. it's yeah. not the 15th century, yeah. uh, doggone it, they sure do seem to be confused. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us.
We're so glad you've joined us today for Digging for Truth. And uh, we are having a fascinating discussion with Dr. Scott Stripling and with Henry Smith in regards to the early date of the Exodus and the, you know, the biblical support of that early date. So thanks for joining us today. Maybe before we, we <clears throat> jump into the New Testament, Dad, yeah. the, the, these, uh, again, these great uh, chronological passages in the New Testament, just helping those who would be watching this take a step back, you know, what exactly are we trying to do here? Mm. Because, you know, we're talking, we're talking about something that's really important, but maybe not everybody understands what, what's the point of all that? Shouldn't we just be looking at these practical passages of the, new, the Bible and just yeah. figure out how to live our lives? Why, why is this even important? Scott, there's a battle for the Bible, and yeah. we are engaged on the front line of this battle. So for those who, who are involved in their church and their ministry, they're interested in issues of daily living, God bless you. We're trying to give you a reliable biblical text. Yes. And there, there yes. are many people who are out to destroy the biblical text. And we're out there on the front line saying, let's give it a fair hearing, okay? Let's get it in an arena of ideas. And we're pretty confident that the Bible will stand up to scrutiny. Yes. So that's why it's important. You know, you're not going to have mm -hmm. something to, to base your, your doctrinal issues on mm -hmm. if you don't have a reliable biblical text. Yeah, and so we're, we're not, we're not trying to, um, uh, we're not trying to make too much out of chronologies as if they are the end all of everything, but they are a part of the revelation of God. And we're dealing in archeology. span So we're looking at the text of the Bible. We're looking at the archeology. span You know, they actually work together pretty well. Well, if I'm off by centuries in my chronology, then what I find in archaeology is, of course, not going to match what I see in the biblical text right. because my chronology doesn't match it. So they go hand in hand. Yeah. So, so when we get that wrong, we have critics criticizing the Bible. We have discouraged Christians. We have people thinking, I don't know if I can trust my Bible, but actually we really can. not So it's really important to get these chronological anchor points correct from the Bible and look at the data in, in, in the ground in archaeology. So, As you were saying that, I just just to add this point here, uh, I think, you know, we're talking mainly Old Testament chronology here, but mm -hmm. even in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Luke, you have these data points, you know, for example, around the time of Jesus' mm -hmm. birth, the census went out during the days of who? Caesar Augustus, mm -hmm. right? So here's a, uh, the Quir Quirinius was the governor of, of Syria. Now mm -hmm. that's a debated issue, but the point is, it's placing it mm -hmm. in the chronology of history. On the eighth day, he went up to be circumcised, mm -hmm. right? All of these, uh, even in the New Testament, yeah. uh, we, we can't, we haven't forgotten, but we want to remind people sure. that this is important to the Lord yep. in, the, in the New Testament, the chronology of Jesus' life, when he mm -hmm. comes into the world, and so on. And, Luke, and Luke's prologue is, hey, I researched it all out. Yes. Yeah. I checked it all out, and here, and here it is. Well, yeah. yeah, I carefully uh, have investigated everything from the beginning. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. right. And yeah. he, he, he wants us to understand uh, how, how, mm -hmm. how this story of Jesus, this account of Jesus' life, actually happened and, and when it happened. Well, these are, all, uh, uh, these are points that are all very, very important. <clears throat> but we better transition into Acts 7. Okay. We want to talk about Acts 7, mm -hmm. verses 29 and 30. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, uh, let's jump in there. Okay, well, here we have one of the most brilliant men in the New Testament, mm -hmm. uh, Stephen, who is a mm -hmm. deacon initially. He's appointed because he has a gift of service, but he also has a clear gift of exhortation and probably mm -hmm. a little prophetic edge on him too. And he's eloquent as a, as a preacher. Mm -hmm. And in his great speech that is recorded here, uh, they were not able to resist the grace with which he spoke. So he, he's speaking under a clear anointing to this, th these people who are gathered. Mm -hmm. And he surveys Israelite history. Yeah. And uh, he seems to be a very educated Greek-speaking Jew. Okay, yeah. So he's a Hellenistic Jew, mighty in the Scriptures. <clears throat> and he's giving this powerful exhortation. And he lays out some interesting chronology. So in verses 29 and 30, Henry, if you want to uh, get that for us, we'll listen to what he says that's germane to our discussion. Yes, uh, so uh, we're, with the context here we'll, we'll pick up is, is around the time uh, the incident where Moses kills the Egyptian, right? right. So, uh, and then he's uh, approached about that. Uh, so he's, the text says this, Stephen says, when Moses heard this, 
uh, he fled to Midian. So this is the, this is the, the context happening, happening, excuse me, He's, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of the burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. And this is, of course, Exodus 3.14, the incident mm-hmm. of the burning bush and the appearance of Yahweh to Moses. So that's the context. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses. Okay, so let's unpack that. All right. what, what's, what's going on? <clears throat> he flees to Midian. <clears throat> we have Exodus 2.23 and Exodus 4.19 that indicate that the Pharaoh of the oppression dies before Moses returns. And so what we're now looking for is a long reign. All right. right. What, what Pharaoh in the 18th dynasty, which is the 15th century BC, had a long reign? And that points us to Tutmosis the third. And um, in our next segments, we're going to get into <clears throat> who the Pharaohs were and the various time periods in this in this discussion. Yes. But um, if if Tutmosi the third, who's scarab, by the way, we found this last summer at uh, Shiloh, if he is the oppression pharaoh, then that makes Amenhotep the second the pharaoh of the Exodus, and this synchronizes beautifully with the early date. So yes. this points us then toward the 15th century B.C. because when you look in the 13th century B.C. as our late date friends would. You have a problem. You only have one Pharaoh with a long reign, and that's Ramesses II. But the Pharaoh that precedes him, which would be the Pharaoh of the oppression, the oppression has right. a very short reign. Right, right. And a late date, they would argue that Ramses is the Pharaoh of the Exodus. That's correct. Right. So he can't be the Pharaoh of the oppression. That's because, right. And he's got, what, 67 years or something like that. He was the Pharaoh, so very, very long. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so, in other words, what I hear you saying is the biographical requirement laid out here in Exodus and in Stephen's speech requires the Pharaoh of the oppression to have reigned for a long time. That's right. And there's very few that fit that criteria. And Tutmosis III fits. Tutmosis III fits perfectly. And coincidentally, um, his successor is Amenhotep II, who we'll see in our next segment, is the very likely, very likely the Pharaoh of the Exodus. So it just fits perfectly. If you try to then put that into the 13th century, it doesn't because the Pharaoh with the long reign is Ramesses II. And right. it and just doesn't it work. It doesn't work. Now, uh, Thutmose III, uh, maybe you give a quick bio on him, really, really quick. He fits the sense of who he is in the text. 54 sure. year reign. Sure. What does he do? beyond what he does to the Israelites. Well, his conquest of Canaan is very significant. So we would date this to about 1483 B.C. Um, He conquers all of Canaan. He writes about this uh, extensively, of course, with some royal propaganda added in, as you always get. (laughs) But, uh, you know, my enemies melted like like wax before me and and all all of this typical stuff. But there's real history that's that's embedded in it. And he he left victory Stella's behind. So, I mean, he was the big guy. And, I mean... um, his, his scarab is very significant because it's easy to read and there's no doubt what it is. And so when, for example, we found it this last summer at Shiloh, that was an important marker because are, are we talking about sites that were, were inhabited at the time that the Bible says the conquest occurred? Yeah. And yeah. that became a very important marker to us. I see, I, I, I've interpreted <clears throat> Tutmosis as my own interpretation, so it, I'm not, not dogmatic about it. But as he sort of softened up Canaan for the Israelites to come in the next generation. That's part of how I interpret it. It was a little easier for them to take the land because uh, Moses had already yeah. beaten them up because it was a tough place. Right. It, uh, the kings that were there were very, vi- it was a very violent, very rough uh, place. And uh, so anyway, that's my own interpretation. Well, it's a good one. I think he softened them up. And then you've got some climate change that's going on at that time. Uh, where, where they're in a period of drought that has just begun. And so it's yeah. getting drier. So they've, they've had this setback militarily, and now they've got some climate change to deal with. And so when the Israelites come in, that, that doesn't yeah. hurt. Yeah, in the providence of God, that's right. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, 
properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Welcome back to Digging for Truth in our continuing conversation on the early date of the Exodus. We're discussing the biblical data, the verses of scripture that help us understand the dating of the Exodus. And we're so glad you are here today to join with us. So we got to move to uh, Acts 13, Acts right guys? 13. Is yeah. that where we're going, mm -hmm. Scott? Yeah. Um, Let's see here, we want to do... Verses 19 and 20. 19 and 20. So this is Paul giving a speech uh, in the synagogue, <coughs> which is, was his common practice. Mm -hmm. He'd go yeah. there first to proselytize to his own people, uh, the Jews. Uh, and of course, he was well-versed in the scriptures. And here he says this, it seems to be an incidental statement, but very important for our purpose. He overthrew, referring to Joshua, uh, seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about... 450 years. I should correct myself. He's referring to God. Mm -hmm. Joshua is the agent that he uses. So all this took about 450 years. Okay. 450 years from when to when? Well, uh, let's see. Um, it looks like from the Exodus, perhaps, perhaps is, is the data point that Paul's mm -hmm. giving. I mean, uh, he's not trying to be overly precise. He's giving an overview like Jephthah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would suggest. Mm -hmm. Well, right? and he's even got a qualifier. He says right. about 450 about. years. Right. So he's right. rounding it off. So let's just deal by generations or, 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 or centuries. Are we in the right century here? Yeah. And absolutely. So, I mean, I would calculate this, this time period at about 476 years that he's discussing. But once again, we're in the mid-15th century B.C. We're exactly mm. where these other five biblical passages have placed us. Now, before someone cavalierly dismisses Paul and Stephen, just better slow down a little bit because in Paul we're talking about a classically trained theologian at Gamaliel's yes. feet yes. Um, and someone who is also mighty in the scriptures, someone who is uh, advanced within late second temple period Judaism mm -hmm. and someone who is fluent in the literature of the day, the extra biblical literature. So, mm -hmm. I mean, he, he is someone who's uniquely equipped to exegete uh, yeah, the these text. passages That's and right. to come up with the, the right, he didn't say about 300 years, he said about 450 yes. years. Yes. Stephen, as we already saw, is, is eloquent and brilliant. So, if you're talking about the most brilliant people of the New Testament, I mean, but, the, the poor Galileans, you know, they get a bad rap. We're not talking here about our Galileans. We're talking yes. here about <laughs> these are these guys are brilliant. Um, yeah. Apollos, Stephen, Paul, these would be the biggest intellects in the New Testament. And they seem to be pointing us to the 15th century. Yeah, I mean, we, we know Paul is, is, is probably versed in what, at least two or three sure. different languages, right? Aramaic, Latin, um, excuse me, Greek, and, and Hebrew, certainly. Sure. So, and his handling of the text, I mean, is extraordinary. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, he's got a reputation for brilliance and a commission from God as an apostle. Well, that's right. So, And why do they that. care about chronology? Okay, why does Stephen... You know, we, here you've got Luke recording a great speech from the first missionary journey, the second missionary journey, and the third missionary journey. So the, yeah. the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, and then at Mars Hill, and then to the Ephesian elders. I'm sure Paul had hundreds of sermons, but he, <laughs> yes. you know, he, he picked representative sermons yes, that, yes, yes. that laid out the great teachings on, on these. Why, why the chronology? embedded in there, even in the New Testament period. So we, we start way back with the Exodus account, and then we have First Kings talking about it, Judges 11 talking about it, First Chronicles 6, 33 through 37, um, Ezekiel 40, verse 1, and now we have Acts 7 and Acts 13. So six independent witnesses all pointing us to this critical day. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, we, we hope our viewers uh, can get excited 
about chronology today, <laughs> right? Because, because really, this is all part of the inspired Word of God, and we are celebrating it here today. Uh, Scott, it's awesome hearing you, you lay this out for us, and, and, and our hope and our prayer is that those watching will be, you know, will be encouraged to look at uh, chronologies and look at the whole Bible and be blessed and encouraged that God has given us His Holy Word. Amen. Amen. Today we've had a fascinating discussion with Dr. Scott Stribling and with Henry Smith, and uh, we're glad you joined us as we've been looking at a subject that's so very important, the early date of the Exodus. Thanks again for being with us today.